Anyone with a handful of classic consoles has inevitably run into the same issue. They have more consoles than ports on their TV. Over the years, I've tested a ton of SCART switches, and now there's quite a few good options. So let's take a look at a few and see how they perform. While I would have loved to have tested every single SCART switch out there, I think a much more realistic goal for this video would be to test some new switches that were just released, test an old favorite, and more importantly, show everybody how I'm testing so that whenever a new switch is released, you could just repeat these tests yourself to see if it's a good quality switch or not. And I really like to do that in all of my videos because showing your work doesn't just help prove the conclusions are true, but it also helps teach other people how to do the same thing. So whether you're a retro gaming fan or a content creator, sit back and let's start nerding. Here's a quick summary of each switch I'll be testing. First, the GSCART switch has been the premium choice for quite a few years and offers eight inputs and two outputs, all with automatic switching. I'll be demoing the latest version that ships with a case that looks similar to this without the plastic around the sides. This bumper case is made by Laser Bear Industries, comes in a ton of different colors, and does a great job keeping dust out of the switch, so I do recommend picking one up. As a note, the switch shown in these B-roll shots is actually an older version of the G-SCART. See, a friend of mine made me a custom metal case for my latest edition G-SCART, but I won't be showing it much as it doesn't match what you'd be getting. The only differences between the two on the outside are the power connector and the sync toggles, as you can see here. The older switches just have a C-Sync on and off switch, while the latest G-SCART uses dip switches to change settings. Next, the SCA-101 is a brand new switch that sells for around $200 with a ton of features, including 10 inputs, RGB gain control, multiple outputs, and picture control. It's also the only switch I've ever tested that supports both SCART, which is a European standard, as well as JP21, which is a Japanese standard that looks identical, but is wired differently. Lastly, I'll be showing the Taxon tool switch, which sells for around 160. It's the only one here that's both an automatic and manual switch. Another switch that I reviewed a while back is the six input, one output at a time Otaku switch. I don't have mine any longer, but I still have my test data from the old review, so I'll be referencing it a bit here. It's by far the cheapest of the bunch, and if you're really on a budget, you can buy it without a case for around $40. One of the most important things to test about a switch is if it adds any interference to the signal, and to do this, I like to use an RGB SCART cable that syncs on composite video for my video captures. For these tests, I'll be using a fully shielded cable that shows no noticeable interference when connected directly to an OSSC. I'll also be using the first level in Super Mario World, as this shade of blue is great for picking up interference. Now, keep in mind that all analog signals will show interference when we zoom in this far. Also, please note that these captures were taken with my usual methods, and all images are integer scaled to this video. This is actually a very clean solution overall, and in contrast, here's an example of how a bad switch looks, like some of those older Bandridge switches. The reason the switch does this is exactly the same reason an unshielded cable adds interference. The colors in the composite video line bleed into the blue line, and this interference is the result. So now that we know we have a clean setup, let's connect the GSCART switch. I'll be connecting the console to the input port farthest from the output port in order to give the signal a long way to travel. I'll also be using the SCART coupler to connect the OSSC, as it's the cleanest way to connect the two. More on that in another video, though. As you can see, there's a tiny bit more interference on the G-SCART switch than direct, but it's impossible to see without zooming in this far. Overall, it looks great. Next, we'll show the SCA-101 using the exact same setup, and this one also performs well. I don't have any JP21 cables to test, but I don't think that would make a difference. And for the record, I did test other ports on the switches just to make sure that they all performed equally and they were all the same. Lastly, the Taxon tool switch seems to have a tiny bit more interference than the others, but I'd still call it a good solution. As a note, the Otaku switch also passed this test as well when I performed it during that previous review. 
I tried taking audio recordings of the switches using a similar setup as before. I also used MD Fourier audio testing tools to compare the difference between how it sounds directly into an OSSC versus through each switch, and the results were pretty close. It's hard to explain them without going into a deep dive, but I also always record game audio for subjective tests as well. I like to use the opening of a Konami game, since the white screen could often cause a buzz on the audio lines. With these subjective tests, all sounded the same except the taxon switch. Now, I doubt most people would notice, and I could only tell the difference with headphones on, but I wanted to mention it just for the audio files. I'll leave links to original samples for anyone interested. Next, I wanted to see how the switch affects the signal of the console by using an oscilloscope to measure how they affect the voltage. For this test, I'll be using a Super Nintendo outputting 100% color bars so we can have a consistent reading. As with before, I'm starting with measurements taken when connected directly to the scope as a base reading. You can see the full composite video signal here with the sync information being the square wave at the bottom. Okay, let's see how the switches handle this. First, through the G-SCART, the RGB levels appeared identical to the control test. When sync regeneration is turned off, the composite video signal matches as well. The latest G-SCART has two types of sync regeneration that are adjusted with jumpers. Toggling the first one will strip the signal of any information that isn't sync. You can see the voltage is still perfect for use with SCART devices as well. The new G-SCART has a few more options though. Toggling the second switch will convert Sync on Green to RGBS. The most common scenario you'll run into Sync on Green is when you're using the PS2 in RGB mode and try to play 480p games. If you have a full RGB setup and don't want to switch to a component video cable when using 480p mode, just toggle this jumper and the switch will automatically convert it to RGBS. Lastly, the third toggle is a special sync regeneration that fixes Sega Master System sync on monitors like this one that have compatibility issues. Unfortunately, it doesn't fix PC Engine sync, but hey, not bad for a free feature. Oh, and as a note, the last toggle switch is for the LED light. Next up is the SCA101, and it also shows all the same voltage levels on the RGBS lines. I tested the levels both with the switch turned on and with it completely unplugged, but it didn't make a difference. As a note, this can operate as a basic switch without any power supply at all, but power is required for all its extra features. Once you've plugged in power and flipped on the power switch, you can now access some other controls. The first I'll show is RGB gain. This can adjust the output down to zero volts all the way to double the original voltage. Now, this is something that kind of walks the line of, is it safe to use or not? And I think the best example I could give is the opposite. So if you have a TV and you turn up the brightness on it, you could get it so bright that it washes out the image, but it's not gonna hurt anything. Alternatively, if you turn up the voltage of the video signal too high, depending on the source device, there's potential to damage your equipment. I realize that since both things have the same effect, it's hard to differentiate between the two, but there is a difference. And while it might be safe to use and play with, I really wouldn't recommend touching the brightness control unless you really understand what you're doing just to be safe. Same goes with the sync stripper. With it turned on, it's outputting TTL level voltage, and you shouldn't use that with SCART equipment. Just to be clear, there's absolutely a bunch of scenarios in which high voltage on the sync line is really good for people's custom setups, but never for SCART setups. If you're going into an OSSC, RetroTank, or FrameMeister, you don't need a sync stripper anyway, and in general, I wouldn't use one unless I knew I needed it. It's my opinion that unless you know you need high voltage, maybe just put some tape over the switch just to remind yourself not to flip it on accidentally. The Taxon tool switch doesn't have a sync stripper, so pass-through is all we need to test. Unfortunately, all the levels seem lower than direct. Not enough to make a huge difference, just a slight dip in brightness. There's some potentiometers on the board that I could tweak if I needed to, but that's never been a requirement with the SCART switch before. I mean, it's totally common to adjust arcade voltages with super guns, but it's very uncommon to see SCART devices require any tweaking like that at all. 
Now, right on the Taxon Tools webpage, they also talk about DC coupling and how the way the switch is built could lead to a situation where no real black is achieved or the colors on certain displays are not correct. They also mention that hum loops are also possible. So they're already acknowledging the audio interference I found before. And from the sounds of it, some consoles might be much worse. I'm not trying to be overly critical of the Taxon, but their own page even discusses this, and none of these are issues with the other switches. Each of these switches offers multiple outputs, but in their own unique way. The GSCART switch has two SCART outputs, which can be safely used simultaneously. The Taxon Tool switch offers one SCART and one set of RCA connectors for each signal that can also be used at the same time. The RCA connectors can be really handy if you're going into an RGB monitor, as all you'd need is a good set of RCA cables and some RCA to BNC connectors. I just use a set of HD Retrovision cables for RGB and audio, then a single cable for sync. Please remember that the signal isn't changing. It's the same RGBS as the SCART adapter, just with a different connector. The SCA101 has a bunch of different options, though. It has one SCART output and RCA outputs, but it also offers an 8-pin mini DIN wired to the XRGB Mini's pinout, and an 8-pin large style DIN with the pinout printed on the bottom of the switch. Simultaneous output is where it gets a bit weird, though. With the RGB gain turned off, the output is just passed to all options, and it's not good to use more than one output at a time. If you do, the voltage will drop, and it'll put a strain on the console. If you turn on the RGB gain control, though, the signal is routed through an amp and should be safe to use multiple outputs, but unless you have an oscilloscope, it's impossible to know how high to set the gain. You can try eyeballing it, but definitely aim for dimmer rather than brighter, as you don't want to raise the brightness so high that it'll blow out your equipment. Honestly, I'd consider simultaneous output an expert-only feature of the switch. As a note, the Otaku switch has two outputs, but only one can be used at a time, as there's no distribution amp. I still like that you have a choice between SCART or RCA for all the reasons mentioned before. Each of these switches have a few more interesting things they can do. Now, with the G-SCART switch, we already talked about its sync regeneration, but it does have a few more tricks up its sleeve. First, while almost everyone just uses the auto-switching capabilities, the G-SCARTs can be controlled by a custom board that connects to the EXT port. A project like this was started a while back, as well as integrating an optical audio switch, but I'm not sure if the project was ever finished. Also, the newest version of the G-SCART switch can pass component video through. Now, it can't convert the signal, but let's say you have seven RGB consoles and one component. If that's the case, just get a custom RCA to SCART cable, plug that console in, and when you're using it, simply press a button on your RGB monitor or OSSC to switch modes, and the signal will pass through. Once again, it doesn't convert the signal. Whatever you put in comes out the outputs. As a note, most manual switches should pass component video through as well, along with pretty much any other signal you throw at it. As long as it's a basic push button switch, everything should just pass through without any problems. Oddly, the SCA101 wouldn't pass component, and it probably uses the sync pin for some kind of detection. The Taxon switch wouldn't pass component in auto mode, but it worked just fine in manual mode. And that's another feature I like about the Taxon. It has both manual and automatic switching options. It's pretty cool that both scenarios are covered. The SCA101 has a really unique feature. It can accept both JP21 and SCART at the same time. The LED next to the port will tell you what signal it detects, then you can select which mode via the gray buttons. Push it in to set it to JP21, or leave it out for regular SCART. The SCART output port is always configured as standard SCART, so as long as the gray switches are set properly, it'll also act as a JP21 to SCART converter. I did run into one issue with the SCA101 though, and I wanted to bring it up in case anyone else had the same problem. It seemed like one of the switches had scraped the inside of the case and was shorting out the color red. After taking the top off, I could see where there was damage causing the short. If you run into this, you could just add some tape to insulate it, but I decided to trim some of the extra connectors in the area. After snipping a few off, it seems like there's plenty of room in the middle, and no other part of the switch seems to be close to the case. 
I spoke to the designer and he said that this was the first time he'd heard of it happening, but that he'd take precautions to fix it in production. Heck, I think just adding a small spacer to that one standoff would be enough to fix it. So if you run into this issue with your Switch, either now or in the future, don't worry, it's a super easy fix. So there is almost zero chance of a SCART switch adding lag to your consoles, but I want to test it anyway, as well as the final feature of the SCA 101, H&V controls that allow you to adjust the image in any direction you'd like. As you can see, there's zero milliseconds of lag both before and after the image shift is turned on. That's a pretty neat feature that I rarely see in the retro gaming world, other than with Xtron devices. I imagine there's a few setups where it would really come in handy. While I didn't show the Otaku Switch too much in this video, it's still my go-to recommendation for anyone looking for an entry-level Switch. The model I tested seemed to work fine, and because of the low price point, I don't even care that it's missing any extra features. I think it works perfectly fine just as a basic Switch. The Taxon Tool Switch performed okay, but at its price point of around 160 and with its issues, everything else seemed like a better option. I like the fact that it's both an automatic and manual switch, but that's the only feature that really stands out. I bet they could cut some cost out by using a PCB as a case instead of a giant 3D printed enclosure, and maybe instead of using a big dial, they could just add a small switch. I think if this SCART switch was under $100, I might be able to look past the issues, just not at that price point. One upside is if you live near their European distributor, you'd save money on tax, shipping, and import charges. But other than that scenario, I'd have a hard time recommending it. I have two conclusions on the SCA 101. First, if you're simply someone who needs the ability to use both JP21 and SCART, I'd recommend buying the switch, but not using the power supply. Just use it as a basic switch and leave all expert features turned off. On the other hand, expert users might really be able to take advantage of this device. I imagine someone running retro game tournaments would really appreciate the RGB gain control, especially to compensate for something like long runs of cables. Also, the high voltage C-Sync might help with distribution or capture issues, and I'm sure the H&V controls can come in handy as well. Please just remember that all of these should be considered expert features. My personal favorite is still the G-SCART switch, but I'll admit that I'm biased based on time. See, the G-SCART has been around for a long time, and each revision has been passed through the hands of some of the pickiest, most brutal retro gamers all around the world. To call it thoroughly tested would be like calling the sun bright. It is expensive though, so my recommendation is to pick what's best for you. Well, that's it for this time. I really hope I was able to provide enough information that you'll be able to make a good decision about which switch would fit your setup best. I also hope I was able to give everybody a good lesson on how to test some of these things, but if you think there's any tests I left out, please leave me a note in the comments and maybe I'll include it next time. Also, if you liked this video, please consider signing up for the support services such as Patreon and Floatplane, because without your support, videos like this, as well as all of the research and development that goes into them, would never be able to happen. Also, if you'd like to be kept in the loop of everything going on in the retro gaming scene, check out the weekly podcast available every Wednesday on all video platforms, as well as everywhere audio podcasts can be found. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.